As U.S. companies develop the next generation of nuclear reactors, Idaho National Laboratory provides the expertise and capabilities to test and validate next generation fuels, materials, and coolants. INL joins other U.S. Department of Energy laboratories in helping companies demonstrate reactor prototypes. By 2030, the laboratories will help host a number of advanced reactors, many of which will operate at INL's desert site. None of these reactors will rival the size and power output of the large light water reactors that provide nearly half the nation's carbon-free electricity. In fact, some are several orders of magnitude smaller. Microreactors are 100 to 1,000 times smaller than conventional nuclear reactors. But the size, portability, and flexibility of microreactors give these tiny powerhouses their advantage. First, microreactors could provide steady, reliable power for remote locations like isolated villages, military bases, and communities recovering from natural disasters. They could supply process heat and electricity for isolated industrial applications like remote mines. In urban settings, microreactors could serve industries that need reliable heat and power beyond the electric grid. They could also help decarbonize other niche industries, including commercial shipping and desalination plants. All of these microreactors benefit from some combination of tomorrow's most advanced nuclear technologies, advanced nuclear fuels, passive safety systems, artificially intelligent operating systems, and state-of-the-art coolants and materials. But to fully realize these reactors' potential, INL's researchers and engineers are building on the past. More than 60 years ago, U.S. Army researchers and engineers developed a handful of small reactors. Several of these reactors operated reliably for years in some of the harshest environments on Earth. Just as tomorrow's advanced microreactors answer the need for portable, reliable power in the face of climate change, increasing national security risks, and a competitive global economy, these reactors from the past answered the Cold War's call and a realignment of global powers. Both generations of reactors serve the nation at the frontier of a new age. It is our belief that the nation's defense posture is constantly being strengthened by the intelligent use of nuclear power. The fact that this plant can be transported by every means of common carrier and the fact that it can deliver 300 kilowatts of electricity for approximately a year without refueling makes it an extremely valuable contribution to our defense effort. The Army reactors benefited from research at the National Reactor Testing Station, the precursor to INL. Here there are more reactors of more advanced and different types than in any equivalent anywhere. This rolling desert plain has been nicknamed Prototype Prairie because here the experimental first models or prototypes of power producing nuclear reactors are built and put through their paces. That research included materials and fuels experiments at the testing station and the development of prototype reactors, including the submarine thermal reactor, S-1W, a design that went on to power the Navy's first nuclear submarine, the USS Nautilus. But before these reactors were shipped around the globe, researchers needed to prove the principle, prove that they could operate safely and effectively. The Army Nuclear Power Program began in 1955 with the construction of the SM-1 reactor in Fort Belvoir, Virginia. On April 8, 1957, SM-1 became the first reactor in the U.S. to generate power for the electric grid. The plant generated 2,000 kilowatts of electricity and was designed to train personnel from the Army, Navy, and Air Force in nuclear power plant operation. The plant shut down in 1973. Chuck Fagley, a retired captain in the Navy's Civil Engineer Corps, worked in the Army Nuclear Power Program from 1962 to 1972, including as the Chief of Operator Training for the SM-1 reactor. It was like the Model T of nuclear power, as far as we, we were concerned. It sustained a lot of abuse just because it was a training facility. I mean, the number of scrams they would have, they would scram maybe two or three times a watch even and it su survived. Trained a lot of operators. I know we had at least 350 Navy that went through that. And uh, all of them, you know, screaming the crop. 
Starting in 1962, the PM-1 reactor successfully powered the North American Air Defense Command's aerospace surveillance post on a 6,600-foot peak near Sundance, Wyoming. The Army built two additional reactors with a similar design, the PM-2A, which powered the U.S. Army's Camp Century in Greenland, and the PM-3A. All three PM reactors were modular, so they could be shipped by airplane and assembled on site. Fagley eventually went on to oversee operations of the PM-3A in Antarctica, but first he traveled to Greenland to learn about operating reactors in extreme environments. I went up to, to, to Greenland for six weeks and learned things about how do you put a nuclear power plant into tunnels in the ice, and um, on the ice cap, and uh, what are the problems with you know, keeping the tunnels cool, and um, and other things like sources of water and all that. The PM reactors didn't just generate electricity, they're also some of the first nuclear reactors to provide heat in the form of steam. The PM1 and PM3A were designed so that their steam would heat buildings in extreme conditions that reached 50 degrees below zero. The plant provided the electricity and ran the whole camp. However, it also produced steam, which was used to produce the water for the whole camp. That was an interesting concept. The way that what they did there was they ran a steam line out to a rig, discharged the steam, and they just started dropping it through the ice cap. And when they got to the ice, they put another rig on, the steam discharged, and formed a gigantic dome inside of the, the ice cap. And they just melted the water. It was crystal clear. In 1961, the Navy shipped the PM-3A to the McMurdo Station Naval Air Facility in Antarctica. Engineers designed the PM-3A reactor to power the National Science Foundation's Antarctic Research Program. The plant was, was a difficult one to operate, particularly because it used air blast coolers. So the steam from the turbines went straight out to these air blast coolers and was condensed and came back as a liquid. Well, when you get into the winter time when you have minus 53 degrees, you know, it's a delicate operation. PM3A operated for more than 10 years before it was decommissioned and sent back to the United States. In January 1961, tragedy struck the Army nuclear power program. At 9.01 o'clock on the night of January 3rd, 1961, the nation's first fatal accident from nuclear reactor operations occurred at the Atomic Energy Commission's National Reactor Testing Station. Workers were preparing to restart SL-1, an experimental microreactor, at the National Reactor Testing Station when a worker removed a control rod too far out of the reactor's core. The resulting explosion killed three people. Today, the SL-1 explosion remains the nation's first and only fatal nuclear reactor accident. Yet demand for portable nuclear energy continued. That same year, ML-1, the first closed-cycle gas turbine, began producing power. The reactor was designed as an integrated reactor package that could be transported by trucks, trains, and barges. The reactor shut down in 1965. In 1964, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers began retrofitting a surplus World War II cargo ship into a nuclear-powered barge. The MH-1A reactor was installed aboard the Sturgis in Fort Belvoir and began operating in 1967. After testing, the barge was shipped to the Panama Canal Zone and moored in Gatton Lake. From there, it provided electricity to the Panama Canal grid for nine years. In the end, the Army Nuclear Power Program built and operated eight nuclear reactors from 1954 to 1977. The lessons learned from Army Nuclear Power Program, including the SL-1 accident, resonate in today's microreactor designs, making them safer, easier to operate, and more economical. You know, the site was established as a National Reactor Testing Station, and so there's a long history of testing reactors on the site, you know, physically testing buildings, testing reactors. So Marvel will represent our first new, new reactor in 50 years, so bringing back, you know, the original mission of the lab. So throughout those years, uh, we've tested 52 reactors. The Army Nuclear Power Program had two very important reactors on the site. One was ML-1, which was a mobile microreactor. Uh, the other one was SL-1, which was a boiling water reactor. ML-1, um, when you look at microreactors, it was 
while they didn't call it that in the day, it's a true mobile microreactor. Their interest in this for Department of Defense today, so you look at, at you know, the missions that some of these were redevelopment for, those are still missions today. Uh, SL-1, the other you know, Army uh, nuclear power program reactor here, boiling water reactor, um, obviously had a tragic accident. Um, there were significant lessons learned in the very early days of nuclear power, particularly related to the nature of that accident, which was a reactivity accident. Fast forward 70 years and researchers are still proving the principle, building on the legacy of the Army nuclear power program by making tomorrow's advanced reactors better, safer, and easier to operate. Take Project Pele, a mobile, inherently safe microreactor designed to demonstrate a resilient, carbon-free energy source for the U.S. Department of Defense. From a strategic perspective, transportable reactors have tremendous potential across military and commercial operations especially when energy is required in austere or remote locations, in response to natural disasters, or to build infrastructure for industrial applications, all with zero carbon emissions. Paul Rogge, a retired Army colonel, helped the Defense Department develop the modern concept of a small, portable nuclear reactor that could provide reliable power for troops in the field. If you think about energy in a more sophisticated way than we usually do, um, it could impact your uh, capabilities. And so we talked about a concept called an autonomous brigade. What if you had a brigade of soldiers, 3,000 people, that you could just set somewhere in the world uh, and not have to refuel them or, or send them water for, say, a month at a time, and they could be combat effective. And we had, an ex we had a past experience of having nuclear reactors out in the field, so at least there was a precedent to tell this sort of story. And so we developed the concept, and so I said, well, you probably want to get rid of the water, have some kind of a coolant that isn't going to boil. So it's probably gas cooled or molten salt or metal cooled. And you want uh, a really durable fuel, so let's put triso fuel in there. Tristructural isotropic triso fuel consists of advanced fuel particles wrapped in carbon and ceramic layers to prevent the release of radioactive fission products. Each triso fuel particle and its protective coating is about the size of a poppy seed. Unfortunately, budget cuts postponed the modern military microreactor program. And then uh, just a few years ago, um, the Strategic Capabilities Office uh, decided to resurrect that idea. And so that is what then became Project Paley. And it basically uses the same requirements, same concepts. Uh, it just basically picked up where we had left off. And of course, they've learned a lot more and, and really have been thoughtful and careful about how that moves forward. Now, engineers with BWXT Technologies are preparing to build Pele as a high-temperature gas-cooled reactor that uses triso fuel, a fully modern descendant of the reactors from the Army Nuclear Power Program. You know, the, the needs that they were trying to address 60 years ago still exist. You know, right now, if you're in these remote locations, you're transporting liquid fuel. Uh, if you think about uh, Antarctica, you know, there's only certain times of year, a year you can do that. Uh, it usually puts limits on your, your uh, installations, on the amount of power you have or heat that you may have. And so it first set, you know, the, uh, the needs or the, uh, the objectives that, hey, nuclear power can provide a solution for these remote areas. Likewise, the Marvel reactor, a sodium-potassium-cooled test microreactor destined for INL's transient reactor test facility, will help commercial partners demonstrate microreactor applications and operating procedures. Construction on the reactor is scheduled for completion in 2026, and initial criticality is expected by 2027, making Marvel the first new reactor at INL in more than 40 years. Like the Army reactors of the past, tomorrow's reactors will rely on a new generation of operators and engineers that will build on the legacy of Fagley and his colleagues. On this new frontier, the operators of tomorrow's advanced reactors will prove the principle once again, advancing the nation's security and economic competitiveness. You know, if you look at the Army Nuclear Power Program, I think one of the reasons why it ended is because the economics just didn't work for the day. It was more effective to just use, you know, liquid fuels or diesel and things like that. Um, so a, a big effort that we have today is to bring these things to a more economical designs and uses that involves, you know, improving the design using, again, I mentioned computing. AI will be a big part of that for control. Uh, and operating these remotely rather than having to have large numbers of, of people operating the reactor on site 
if we deploy a lot of these, we're going to need for these reactors to operate either autonomously, semi-autonomously, or remotely. AI can, can also be used in design, uh, but getting the economics down is going to be important. The reactors are you know, being uh, designed to be highly manufacturable. In the end, Fegley and his colleagues pioneered micro-reactor technologies before their time. Now, these pioneers are eager to see their early efforts realized. We need this in the United States. Nuclear is clean, uh, nuclear is safe, it's reliable, and I'm sure they're going to make it very, very reliable with the technology today, electronics and, and everything else we've learned over the years.